Welcome, everybody, to the live stream. Do not adjust your sets right now. Yes, uh, I'm in a green screen pool. And the reason I'm in this pool is because I have a herniated disc and I cannot stand up. So the best place to do these live streams from now on would probably be in this pool. So before we get going, because there's going to be a lot of things we're going to go over. First of all, let me know how the audio sounds using a new microphone, obviously, because I'm outside. And uh, let's see how it actually sounds before we move on to the big story, which is Michael Saylor and the things that he talks about as far as custody. And I can tell you right now that this is going to be a very divisive topic that we talk about because of what people believe to be true. But I'm going to tell you, uh, there's a big difference between what should be and what's going to be. So... <clears throat> Let's just jump into it, shall we? And uh, this is what Michael Saylor said. This was on Squawk Box, and I posted this on Twitter. We're going to read some response and go from there. So just, just take a listen. For the industry to move to the next level, we need to migrate uh, to adult supervision. We're going to need big banks to become the crypto custodians. We're going to need Wall Street to take a role. And we need to rationalize away from the hundred thousand crypto tokens you know yo-yo coins that people are manipulating to bitcoin Bit bitcoin is a is an asset without an issuer it is the one universally recognized protocol that's a commodity in the space so when banks on wall street and responsible custodians are managing bitcoin and the industry takes its eyes away from all of the shiny little tokens that have distracted and and demolished shareholder value i think the industry moves to the next level and we 10x from here for the well i gotta tell you i like that part the 10x from here part and um i mean working from there that sounds pretty good right but the thing we have to take a look at i think the most important thing is what he talks about which is when we're talking about Custody. This is a big thing. This is a big thing that's bigger than what people realize. And when I first heard this, there, there's, there's context and there's a lot of things that we have to pull, be, pull in from what Michael actually said here. Because this is only a 51 second clip. Who knows what he said before? Who knows what he said after? I couldn't find the rest of it. But you have to take it with a grain of salt. But the thing is, is it opened up a, a pretty good debate. And the thing I'm taking a look at is the different things that, uh, that people said here. I thought it'd be a slam dunk. People would say, that's ridiculous. Why, can, why would anybody ever do that? That's not the point of Bitcoin, which is, makes a lot of sense. But a lot of people said, and they were pretty good. Uh, Black says this. Black's Kaiser. That's funny. Everyone needs to relax. Big institution and banks being involved at some point were a given. Hal Finney himself anticipated Bitcoin banks. I think peer-to-peer -peer is just as valid a concept at the micro level, person to person, as is the macro level. And there's a lot of things that, <laughs> it's fun. There's a lot of things that you can glean from this. And uh, this will be an open conversation. We go into, into the Q&A. But here's the thing. Me personally, uh, I was under this assumption too. And uh, I even talked about this when there was different custodians that were out there. Remember Voyager? Remember Celsius? Remember FTX? And some people say, well, those aren't banks, Rob. Those aren't banks. No, they're not, but they're a centralized entity and they, and they held our crypto. Now, does that mean that, that these banks, once they collapse, they can, they can take our crypto away? Well, potentially. And we have to understand that there's a reason why banks make money. It's called fractional reserve lending. So if you don't want a bunch of paper Bitcoin, these are the things you have to look out for. And also people will say, but... What's great about it is that, you know, they take the responsibility. They take the brunt of it. Well, that's true. But there are stories all the time about people who get scammed out of their hard-earned money from that they have in the banks that they can't get back. This is just one story. Man loses 57000 to scammer. He can't get his money back. And what he did was he, he paid the scammers for a car that he, that he, that he saw online. And they weren't able, they cashed the check, but it wasn't transferred in time at Wells Fargo. He had another bank. He told Wells Fargo to stop that check. It was a fraudulent activity. They did that. And now months later, he can't get his $57,000 back. That's just one example. There's many examples where people been, have been scammed out and they can't get their, their money back. So 
when I look at all these things and I think to myself, well, what's the, what's the, the gradual outcome? And the outcome is going to be like this. I'm just going to tell you guys like it is straight. I don't believe that we should use any type of, of custody. And uh, I don't think that, that people are that dumb or careful. Well, they can't write down 12 or 24 words and keep it someplace safe and not lose it. I think that people are not complete morons and they can do those things. Will they lose somewhere? Well, they don't, if they don't uh, take it as seriously as you think they would, but I got to tell you, if, if you have in your hands, your entire life savings, I think you'd be pretty damn careful about what you do. So I take a look at that and then people say, well, what about these boomers? First of all, I'm old. What about these boomers, Rob? They can't, they can't, you can't expect them to do that. I'm like, listen, pal, uh, at one point, people didn't know how the hell to do email. They figured that out. And then people didn't know about debit cards. We figured that out. And then, of course, people didn't know about how to use a Venmo, PayPal, or Cash App. And we figured that out. And people say, so you're going to leave people in the dust? Look, if you don't want to use Bitcoin and you don't want to do it, then you can't, and you don't want to custody it, then that's up to you. And then you can deal with the consequences moving forward. But the people that learn, which I got to tell you, it's not hard. I think they're the ones that are, are doing pretty well. And to piggyback off that, I will just say that one, a, a positive aspect of this is businesses like MicroStrategy. And again, I'm not going to speak here for Michael Saylor, what he said in this interview. I'm sure he's going to elaborate on that on the other you know, 10, 20 different podcasts that he goes to. But I think the bigger picture that we need to look at is this. And some people said that like, look, Michael's a genius because he's saying, he's telling Wall Street what they want to hear. He's telling the organizers what they want to hear. And he's actually showing these businesses what they should be doing. This is a micro strategy outperform since adoption of Bitcoin strategy. This is a stock performance since August 10th of 2020. This is current as of July 31st, 2023. I got to tell you, if you're a company and you look at something like this, you're like, how the heck did that happen? MicroStrategy went up 254%, Bitcoin 140 dollars that's not bad. S&P 537, NASDAQ, I mean, you can read. I don't have to do this for you. So I think when we take a look at this, people are like, wow, maybe we should look into that on top of the fact that, you know, you've got BlackRock and Fidelity and everybody else trying to get a, a spot Bitcoin ETF. And you got the Paul Tudor Jones and the Stanley Druckenmiller's out there and they're talking about how Bitcoin could change the world. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a pretty positive play. I will just lastly say before we move on which is this my goals aren't your goals and michael saylor's goals probably are a little bit different than yours i don't know if you're maybe you are a billionaire i, I don't know who's watching the, the show but uh for michael saylor and his company microstrategy it is a net positive to hold and never sell bitcoin because it is good for his company and i don't blame him it's, it's done fantastic work for my, I don't know if they've ever been up 254% in three years for the stock price, but it is a proxy against, say, an ETF if it is or is not approved. So for him, it makes total sense to diamond hands and hold forever. He said he's going to hold for 100 years. The question is, what is your thing? What is the thing that you need to do? What is the thing that is best for you and your family? And that I can't answer for you because I'm not a financial advisor. And I'm sure it's not your dad. So for me, I think this is net positive, but let me know what you think about this in the comment section, especially with the, with the custody. Again, the way it's, the way it's should be, I feel is like we shouldn't let the banks custody for the things I just laid out, but how it's going to be is banks are going to custody Bitcoin and we're going to allow, we're not going to allow this to happen. What you, you can't change the world uh, for everybody. You got to change it for them one at a time. And hopefully once people figure it out, it's the same thing with like centralized exchanges. Some people just have to learn the hard way. And I am one of those people included. When I got in in 2017, I heard about Mt. Gox. And I was like, that'll never happen because look at all these centralized exchanges. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to go into this, but you, you know what I'm saying? People are going to make their mistakes. They're going to fall hard. And that's just how it goes. So anyhow, let me just think about that in the comments. And speaking of companies that are doing pretty damn well, just by implementing Bitcoin. This is a, a quick piece. Uh, Jack Dor Dorsey, former owner of Twitter, now called X. It's Elon Musk bought him out. Jack Dorsey's block had 5.62 billion in revenue, 44 million in Bitcoin profits in Q3. Bitcoin revenue contributed to as much as 43% of its total revenue. That's pretty good. 
So just real quick, 44 million in profits on its Bitcoin holdings, thanks to a price surge in recent months. Bitcoin gross profits stood at $45 million, up by 22% year over year. And the firm selling two, man, they sold almost two and a half billion dollars worth of Bitcoin to customers via the Cash App. I always thought the Cash App, you, it, was a, it was a minimal charge for Bitcoin, like very, very low. But I took a look at the uh, prices. It's actually not that low. So for Cash App, if you're buying $10 to $100 worth of Bitcoin, it's 2.25. And of course you can read, but uh, I thought it was interesting. I'm like, well, I mean, everybody's got to get paid, right? But uh, that's, uh, that's something. Anyhow, so that's good part there. And then also I wanted to uh, just talk about some more positive things uh, moving forward. This is uh, Yves Lamoureux. Nailed it. He is the president of Lamoureux and Company, market research based on uh, behavioral economics. I just found this interesting. As he talked about, hey, the signal one you got already. Signal number two, the CME Bitcoin open interest hits an all-time high. This is on November 1st. And I was like, is that true? Let's take a look here at the CME group. And this is the open interest for Bitcoin futures. And uh, this is volume right here. But the interest itself, it wasn't today or yesterday. I think it was the first. Yeah. Open interest is 20664 So that just means contracts are are being opened up and they're they're active and ready. And you can see that over time, yeah, he's absolutely right. And then the volume is not as high as it used to be, but uh, open interest, I think there's a lot of room to run. So again, that's a, that's a good thing to see. I like that. And uh, these are the good parts about Bitcoin. But people may ask, but Rob, what about all these altcoins? Well, glad you asked. Solana has been having quite a, a huge rally lately. It took a little bit of a dip, but no big deal. And I wanted just to go over this because uh, it's about a price prediction. Now, I personally don't like price predictions. And the reason is I don't like price predictions is because I think they're goofy. And I think people are just guessing. They're educated guesses, but it gets people's hopes way, way, way too high. Hopium is good in small doses, I think. But uh, I'll just read this to you. We'll go from there. So this was uh, talks about, this is from Coindesk, Solana's, uh, Solana's rally marshaled by buyers from, Coin, from Coinbase. It's back to the 25th, the CVD or cumulative volume delta increased by a million on Coinbase. CVD metric tracks the net difference between buying and selling volumes. You can see that, yes, this isn't this, the dark navy blue. Coinbase is uh, out, outpacing uh, everybody as far as uh, Solana being sold and bought. More, sell, more buying than selling. But you can see on the exact opposite. I mean, there's up bit. Looks like a lot of people are actually selling. And then also for a little bit, uh, OKX is flat. And then Binance was selling quite a bit, but uh, has done that. So that's the pretty great. The question becomes, why Solana? Why now? Well, this comes after Van Eck, a multi-billion dollar institutional asset manager, uh, published a report detailing a bullish case scenario that could take the crypto's price as high as $3,200 by 2030. What is it now? Like $41, $42? That's quite, quite a difference. That said, Sol's recent price gains have yet to galvanize on-chain activity. And in two weeks, the total value of assets locked in Solana DeFi protocols has declined from $12 million to $10 million, low since April 21. So what I want to do is I want to take a look and just break that down. First of all, price predictions. Where did they, where did they get this from? It's from this report. And Patrick Bush and Matthew Siegel, both part of the digital asset research team, they came up with this. Great educated guesses. They state, by 2030, our Solana valuation scenarios predict a sole price range from a bearish $9.81 to a bullish $3,211. Let me say that again. These guys are geniuses. Because that's what I would do. I would just give you the biggest wide swath and just say, hey, bear case, under 10 bucks. It should be like 20% of what it is now to a bullish case of $3,200. Somewhere in between, it's going to be there. That's it. That's pretty good. And it's like the people that are that look at this, they're like, bullish. I'll take that, $3,200, which is fine, right? These are the types of, uh, of uh, price predictions. I don't really mind too much because it gives you a big wide swath. And I'll give you my price prediction for Bitcoin next year. It's going to be between It's going to be between $5.00. And $7 million. I'm pretty sure I nailed that. 90% accuracy right there. But there's another piece to that. 
which I want to take a look at, which was DeFi and lockups. So of course, I'm going to show you DeFi, some on-chain analysis, and also my my biggest indicator, I think, is fees. So DeFi Llama, there's a link in the description for this exact page. You can take a look at this yourself. As far as total value locked up and all the change, Ethereum is still crushing everybody, 52%. Tron, as everybody laughs at, but I just used a couple of days ago, super fast. Tron is super fast. And people say, well, it's centralized. That's true, but so no one really seems to care about that for BNB chain, so whatever. But Tron's got uh, almost $8 billion. Binance Smart Chain, $4 billion. Ton, look at that. Almost $3 billion come out of nowhere. Arbitrum, one of my favorites, which is lagging as far as price indicators go, 4.72, Avalanche, blah, blah, blah. And Solana, Solana, $816 million. So what the heck happened? Well, first of all, I like this little piece right here. Whoops, hey, 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 stop messing around. So you can just see in the blue, as of in 2020, Ethereum had 90, almost 96% of the market share of everything locked up. And look, as all the different chains came in, that's called take eating away at market share. And you can just see that actually as of, I think we peaked out for Ethereum recently in March. That's 61%. Then you can see it gradually decline. Now we're at 52, somewhere around there. And of course, the Trons, the Binance Smart Chains, the Arbitrums pick it up. But Polygon, not that much, quite honestly. So then the question is, okay, well, if they're not locking it up, but there's, got to, there's a lot of TPS, there's a lot of transactions going on, right, Rob? Well, there is, as a matter of fact. This is SoulScan. You can also find this in links in the description as well. I want to show you this. This TPS, transactions per second, 3,000, 4,500, 6,000. It's been said that the transactions per second, the throughput, is extremely high, 65,000, somewhere around there. And we take a look at the transactions. Look at all these transactions. That's huge. Like, that's a lot. What's all this teal green stuff? Well, that's vote TPS. And the true TPS is this little topper. Well, what's the difference? Great question. The difference is this. Vote transactions are transactions that involve a voting account. Vote transactions involve configuration, registration, vote collection, and new vote signing. That's it. It's only people moving back and forth, a lot of different uh, different objects on the different uh, sells or buys on the blockchain, which is Solana. It's not just voting. It's, it's imperative that this is done, but these are just vote transactions. Configuration, registration, vote collection, and new vote signing. Non-vote transactions of all transactions that do not interact with the vote program. These include transactions that interact with the dApps built on Solana. At the time of writing, Solana's average non-vote TPS is 759. Three quarters of Solana's transactions are vote transactions. And uh, it might be a little bit higher than that, I think. But this article was written in 2022, so hey, whatever. Uh, again, so when people are talking about the the TPS, first of all, whatever. I mean, I'm sure it's fast. It's very fast. Um, and so everybody knows if I'm talking about it, it means I own it. Uh, so I own Solana. I own Bitcoin. I own Cardano. I own Chainlink, all those things. You can watch me on Sunday. I'll show you exactly what I what I own and how much I'm up and down as far as like the percentage wise. But the big thing I always say to look at is it's not just the TPS and the transactions of what's going on because you can you can... You can take those transactions and you can fudge the numbers. But what you can't fudge, or is a little bit more difficult, is the fees. You're, what you're doing is you're actually paying for something and using that chain. And that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where you put your money where your mouth is. And there's a website called CryptoFees.info. Come on down to Solana, 10th, 11th, one down. And they got a seven day and a one day fee. Here's the thing. If you click on that and click on more details, what you want to know, because right now you're some of you are are probably shouting at the screen, but Rob, Solana is super cheap and Ethereum is super expensive, so that's why they have more fees. You are at 100% right, pal. That's right. You are right. What I want to show you is just as things increase or decrease. That's what you want to take a look at. Are people using this more? Are they paying for it? Or what's going on? So let's still go all the way back. February, I just picked a random date. February 2021. You can just see that people were using Solana like crazy. They were voting with their pocketbook, right? But as you can see, as time has gone on, they're not really using as much, right? 
I mean, you can see that's pretty much average. And of course, there was the big, big decline. I think this was around, yeah, November 2022. This is when uh, FTX roughly collapsed, and of course, collapsed FTX or collapsed Solana because uh, that was uh, Scam Wankman's uh, favorite chain. Yeah. And you're gonna see that uh, as far as fees, no one wanted to use it, no one wanted to buy it. But for the positive, we can see that we have seen a little bit more of an uptick to 80,000, which I don't think has really happened since yeah, a year and a half ago, roughly. So things are looking not too bad. This is the indicator that I would put more weight to as far as what is actually being used as people are voting for their pocketbook. And also, just to reiterate some things, which is this. You understand that Solana is super cheap to use. I mean, look at that transaction fee, 0.00025. And of course, people are going to say, but Rob, it's centralized and it goes down all the time. Hey, it hasn't gone down this year. So at least they're on the right direction. Ethereum, is that's a laughable. $21, I paid more for that during the peak seasons. Cardano, very cheap. Avalanche, cheaper. Polkadot, roughly the same. Algorand, super duper cheap, but not as cheap as Solana. And of course, here's the transactions and throughput. You can just see which one's kind of winning. However, out of all these things I just talked about, throughput and transaction fees, you know what beats Solana? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Well, not Bitcoin per se, but the Lightning Network. I did not know this. And uh, I didn't know it was this good. Check this out. This is from Kraken. What's the Lightning Network? Well, it's a layer two solution for Bitcoin. It means it doesn't happen on chain, it happens above the chain, it's off chain. So people are doing transactions, thousands, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. And it's up to a million transactions per second. Isn't that crazy? A million transactions per second. So when we take a look at, like again, like Solana, 65,000, that's nice. But hey, I guess, I guess maybe Bitcoin can be used for payments. Again, this is from Kraken. The Bitcoin Lightning Network aims to solve these limitations by providing instant and inexpensive transactions while achieving a throughput of approximately 1 million TPS. And as a reminder, uh, Bitcoin right now can do seven, I believe, transactions per second. So not too great. This is actually verified also by BitPay because I'm like, that doesn't sound right, but I'll be damned if it was. A million transactions per second. Now, it's capable of handling a million. I don't know if it's actually been stress test enough. I will leave that for the comment section. But uh, again, this is also from Blockstream. Bitcoin, 7 TPS, E30, Litecoin, da da da, da. Solana, 65,000. And it says that Bitcoin, theoretically, Lightning Network can go up to 42 million transactions per second. Who'd have thunk it? So maybe we will be able to go to Starbucks and buy some coffee. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And lastly, I just want to finish up before we get in the Q&A is two indicators that I thought were pretty good. I'm going to uh, redo part of that uh, selling strategy video. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there is a link in the description. It looks like this. When and why I'm selling 80% of my crypto. And there's a video right there you can watch. These are the indicators I'm looking at. There's seven or eight different ones. One of the ones I like to talk about is the Bitcoin risk bands. You can find this on Ben's site, Into the Cryptoverse, 10% uh, 10 off for the first month. Links in the description. Some of these things are free. Some of these are not. Uh, there's different tiers. So that's what's going on. If I was you, maybe Ben's going to have like a, a Black Friday day sale. So just wait. Just wait to sign up. But what I thought was interesting is when I was talking about these, these Bitcoin time spent and risk bands, right now, Bitcoin is currently a 0.5 to 0.6 risk band, which that happens 556 days out of, the, out of the entire existence of Bitcoin. Now, look at this. See this one right here? 0 0.9 to 1.0. That's when things get way overheated. And it's only been 18 days in like the 13, 14 year, 2009, whatever. 14 years or so of Bitcoins in existence, right? That's 18 days. And then 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 is 80. So when we're trying to like, I can't time tops and I really can't time bottoms. That's why I'm just a dca -er. But I found it fascinating that with this one, check this out. See all this? This is the Bitcoin price color color coded by risk levels. 
And of course, it goes from the 0 0.0, 0 0.1, which you can see is a lot. And usually that happens when, you know, after the after everything gets uh, blow off top and then it crashes, blow off top and crashes. But check this out. I'm going to hide all these. I'm just going to put in 0 0.9 to 1.0, which is the 18 days. You know what those 18 days are? Bam, right there. Doesn't that look nice? Huh? I don't know if you can see that really well. But uh, yeah. Topper? Topper. Topper, topper, topper. And over here, not the absolute top, but uh, if I could sell at 57,000, I'd be okay with that. So I didn't hit 69. And then look at this one. I'm going to put in the 0 0.0, 0 0.9. Same thing. Da -da -da. So if you're worried about like, you know, finding some tops, there's a lot of indicators. And of course, don't just follow me. There's a lot of smarter people than me to figure this out. But uh, that's a good one. And also, I want to show you this one. This is from Look Into Bitcoin. And it's called the Bitcoin Cycle Master. And uh, this one is, uh, it's free. There's a link in the description as well. But you can just see that uh, this one actually called the tops uh, pretty well too. This little red band here, except for, actually, no, it did really well. As it's going through these price fluctuations. But again, uh, the best thing to do is to look in the different uh, indicators. But I like these two. These ones will probably be, uh, I'm going to add them into the video. But that's it for today. So look, again, don't adjust your set. I'm in this pool today because I messed up my back and I cannot stand up for more than like 20 minutes. <laughs> starts. So I'm in the pool and I can uh, stand up straight. But thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything I talk about is roughly time sensitive. But that's it for today. So.